Gregor Mandel, the friar who grew peas. All of his life, Gregor Mandel hungered for knowledge. Born in 1822 in a country that is now called the Czech Republic, Gregor grew up in a village with 71 houses, 479 people, 41 horses, and 98 cows. His father was a hardworking farmer who hoped his only son would follow in his footsteps. Over time, the people in Gregor's village had learned that growing two kinds of apple trees together could produce better fruit and that breeding two kinds of sheep together could yield thicker wool. Gregor longed to know why and how. He yearned to unlock nature's secret and to share them with everyone. Gregor wanted more knowledge than the village grammar school could provide. The next level of school was a half a day's journey away. To attend, he would have to eat and sleep there. His parents scraped together enough um, every cent they could, but they could only afford to pay for classes, a bed, and half of Gregor's meals. Twelve-year-old Gregor went anyway. He chose to feed his mind and go without food. At school, he feasted on his lessons instead. Tragically, in 1838, Gregor's father broke his back and could no longer till his fields. Gregor later wrote an essay on his life. The scholar, then 16 years of age, was unfortunately compelled to fend for himself. Gregor worked as a tutor and paid his own way through four more years of school. Even when he was sick, Gregor never fell behind in his lessons. As he neared graduation, he worried that he could not find enough tutoring jobs to put food on the table next to his books. He feared that his growling stomach, at least, would halt his studies. It had become impossible to continue such strenuous exertions, he wrote. I needed to be spared perpetual anxiety about the means of a livelihood. Gregor's problems were solved when he became a friar. At the Abbey of St. Thomas, Gregor could feed his body, mind, and soul. His fellow friars preached sermons, cared for the sick, taught school, and were respected community leaders. They were also mathematicians, botanists, philosophers, and geologists. They studied at a library where 30,000 books lined the walls. They discovered ideas over three plentiful meals a day. Surrounded by great thinkers, Gregor plunged into further studies. He became addicted to nature, he later wrote. I would shrink from no exertions which might help me to fill in the gaps in my information. The abbot, the head of the abbey, rewarded Gregor's zeal. He sent the young friar to the University of Vienna to study with some of the world's best scientists. There he learned all that he could about nature's miracles that can be explained by a few simple laws of universal laws. Universal laws explain that some things will always act in the same way, even in different settings. For example, the universal law of gravity tells us how things move through space, explaining why an apple will always fall toward the earth, whether it is dropped from a tree or from the tallest church spire. Gregor learned how to test such laws with carefully planned experiments. You can see he's dropping it from the tree and then from the church spire. When Gregor returned to the abbey, the abbot asked him to teach science at a nearby school. Scientists liked Gregor's clear explanations and lively sense of humor. He could make any intellectual food nutritious and tasty, a student once said. Gregor liked nourishing young minds, but he still hungered to make a great discovery himself. He focused his attention on one of the hottest scientific questions of his time. How do mothers and fathers, whether they are apple trees, sheep, or humans, pass down their traits to their children. In Gregor's day, no one knew why a child might have her father's blue eyes and straight hair, while her brother might have their mother's brown eyes and curly hair. Features such as brown eyes and curly hair are called traits. Gregor believed that all plants and animals pass down traits from their parents to children in the same way. By finding a pattern for how this occurs in one life form, he hoped to crack the code for all living things. Gregor read how earlier scientists had paired different species or kinds of plants to see what their offspring or children would be like. 
The offspring of such matches are called hybrids. By pairing different types of corn, flowers, and wheat, earlier scientists bred many hybrids but studied only a few of them. Gregor had something else in mind. He would breed thousands of offspring from just a few pairings. He would count how often specific traits appeared. He would then see if the math would help him find a pattern. If all went well, he would have a universal law that would apply to living things. And we can see the parents here and then pass down to offspring. Gregor knew that he must choose the plants of his experiment carefully. He studied 34 kinds of peas in his garden. At first, the plants looked so different that Gregor wondered how he would ever decide which specific traits to track. He looked more closely and noticed that all of the peas are on a pea plant seeds were either yellow or green. Gregor liked these traits because they were clearly distinct. Similarly, some of the peas were smooth and some were wrinkled. Gregor picked seven pairs of contrasting traits, such as these, to test in his experiment. He planned to breed each pair and record how often each trait appeared in their offspring. Before beginning the test, Gregor grew some plants again and again to be sure that each kind of pea always produced offspring with the same trait. He wanted to be sure that any changes in their offspring were caused by his experiment. After two years of preparation, Gregor was eager to start breeding his plants to make hybrids. He knew that the pea plants usually form seeds when pollen from one part of the flower fertilizes egg cells from another part of the same flower. To create his hybrids, he would need to meddle with nature's process. In the spring, Gregor used tweezers to peel open the inner petals of a flower on a yellow pea plant. He stimped away the flower stamen so that it could no longer make pollen. Then he brushed the egg cells in the same flower's pistil with the pollen from the green pea plant. When he was done, he tied a tiny sack around the flower to prevent another plant's pollen from drifting in on a breeze or on the legs of a bee or a butterfly. This way, he was positive that no other plant had pollinated the flower. Step by step, Gregor pollinated 287 flowers by hand, working his way through the seven pairs of traits, smooth peas, wrinkled peas, yellow pea pods, and green pea pods, smooth pea pods, and bumpy pea pods, and so on. His fingers moved carefully as a mistake might spoil his results. Then Gregor waited. He would not remove the sacks until the flowers had been replaced by pea pods filled with seeds. He nurtured the plants that he joked were his children. Finally, fall came, and Gregor eagerly split open the newly ripened pea pods. What do you think he found? The yellow pea plants bred with green pea plants had yielded all yellow peas. When he bred smooth peas with wrinkled peas, he got all smooth peas. Gregor observed that in each of these seven pairs of traits, all of the hybrid children looked like just one of the parents. Were the lost traits gone forever? What would the grandchildren and great-grandchildren look like? Gregor pondered these questions throughout the snowy winter. Come spring, he planted the seeds of the hybrids that he had bred. This time, he allowed nature to take its course, and he let the flowers fertilize themselves. He waited and he watched. At harvest time, once again, Gregor split open the ripened pods. He discovered yellow peas and green peas sitting side by side in the same pod. He also found wrinkled peas beside smooth peas. The missing traits had reappeared. When Gregor harvested his crop, Gregor found that all of the plants grown from the green peas sprouted peas that were filled with only green peas. Some of the peas grown from the yellow peas sprouted pods with only yellow peas. But most of the plants grown from the yellow peas sprouted peas with both yellow and green peas. Gregor planted the seeds four more times. In each of the different pairings, he achieved the same results. He had discovered a pattern. Gregor's results reminded him of the math that he studied at the university. Sometimes numbers create a pattern just like the one found in peas. 
If the p traits follow the same rules as the numbers, then each trait must be made up of two separate parts that mix and match to create a pattern. Suddenly Gregor was seeing heredity, how parents pass traits down to their children, in an entirely new way. He concluded that every pea plant that has two building blocks necessary to create any one trait. Today these blocks are called genes. For every trait that the mother and father plants, each give one gene to their child. So we can see our first generation, our second generation, and now we're seeing a variety in our third generation. Now Gregor knew why the pea plants that he had grown at the start of his experiment had always produced children exactly like themselves. The yellow pea plants had only yellow pea genes to give their children. When Gregor crossed the yellow peas with the green peas, each hybrid plant had one yellow pea gene and one green pea gene. In the first, ex first generation of the hybrid plants, all of the peas were yellow because the yellow gene hid the green gene from view but the green pea genes were still there to be passed down. Gregor called the genes that masked the other genes dominant, and the genes that were hidden were called recessive. He found that the recessive genes are just likely as dominant genes to be passed on to children, and whenever a recessive gene meets up with another recessive gene, it surfaces for the whole world to see. This explains why the green peas and others' lost traits show up in later generations of Gregor's experiment. Gregor also discovered that the traits act independently. Being green in color did not make peas any more likely to be wrinkled or smooth in shape. Over eight years, Gregor grew close to 28,000 pea plants. He also tested his theory in smaller trials on 14 other kinds of plants. Gregor's hunger for knowledge had led to the great discovery, and it was time to tell the world. And we can see the yellow is Y, and the green denotes green. I'm sorry, the G denotes green. In 1865, Gregor presented his findings to the Natural History Society. A year later, he published them in a scientific journal, but no one paid attention. No one understood that his discovery was much more than peas. They could not connect the pea experiments with apple trees, sheep, or people. Also, genes were too tiny to be seen by microscopes available in that day. Without more evidence that genes really existed, how could people believe in something they couldn't see? Gregor lost his appetite for plant experiments, and he recently had become elected as the abbot and the new duties absorbed him. However, he did not surrender faith in his, in his theory. He told his friends, my time will come. In 1884, after a long illness, Gregor died at the age of 63. The entire town mourned the passing of a beloved teacher and community leader. In 1900, three different scientists and three different countries stumbled upon the paper that Gregor had published in 1865. Each was on the verge of repeating Gregor's discovery, and each was stunned at the foresight of this unknown friar. Although he received no glory during his lifetime, he is known as the first geneticist. His discoveries are called Mendel's Laws, and today we use genetics to prevent and cure diseases make crops hardier, solve crimes, and learn even more about nature's ways. More than a century after his death, Gregor's discoveries continue to fuel new insights about our world. The dream that he had written about as his youth came true. May the insight of destiny grant me, the supreme ecstasy of earthly joy, the highest goal of earthly ecstasy, that of seeing when I rise from the tomb, my art thriving peacefully, among those who are to come after me. And that's it. Thanks for listening.